Uh, we're really fortunate today, I, I believe, to have uh, Professor Michael Omi with us from uh, the University of California at Berkeley uh, to talk in particular about uh, the census and its um, and the future of American politics and the, the what's at stake in the 2020 American census. So Professor Michael Omi uh, is Professor of Ethnic Studies and Asian American and Asian Diasporic Studies here at UC Berkeley. He also holds appointments in the fields of sociology and in gender and women's studies, which means that this man uh, basically holds appointments on more than half of the floors of what is formerly known as Barrows Hall. And I do hope to um, talk to him a little bit about that, uh, perhaps at the end of today's lecture. Uh, he's also the Associate Director of the Haas Institute for the Fair and Inclusive Society, and is best known as the, um, you know, a major pioneer, founding contributor to the sociology of race in the United States. And I think it's particularly important that um, you know, what we have here, uh, the reading that we did in the lecture that I gave on Monday deals quite explicitly and directly with Professor Omi and Professor Howard Winant's work um, in particularly their groundbreaking book, so Racial Formations in the United States. Now, I, I wanted uh, two things about this. The first is that this is a critical work of sociology in thinking about race and racial formations. And it's important, I think, that this is the kind of work on race in particular that is emerged out of uh, California, as from California-based intellectuals and using the West Coast as a different kind of basis to think about comparative racial formations. That the traditional thinkers um, and the historiography and sociology of race is traditionally grounded in the racial binarisms of the East Coast of the Black-White Dyad. Uh, which is, of course, an essential and structuring um, uh, organization of society, of the constitution, of our political structure. But uh, political thinkers and thinkers, particularly around the question of race, starting um, you know, uh, with Carrie McWilliams and others in the early 20th century who came to rethink the question of race in the United States from the position of California, that it was not the singular color line, but color lines or what Carrie McWilliams would describe as racial fault lines of mobile, multiple overlapping categories and divisions of race that are characteristic of the state of California. And I think Professor Omi and Professor Weinert, who teaches in sociology at UC Santa Barbara, um, is that this is, you know, extraordinarily important ways in which Californian intellectuals have re helped us rethink uh, racial politics in the United States. Um, just on a personal note, I will say that um, in the fall of 1996, I entered graduate school and I took Professor Hazel Carby's class, the first seminar I ever attended as a graduate student on theorizing racial formations in the United States. And the first book I was assigned to read was the second edition of Omi and Winant's Racial Formations in the United States. This book shaped comprehensively the way that I think about race. The lecture I gave on Monday indicated very clearly that not only the usefulness of the tools and the definitions that Professor Omi and Wynett have established for us, but this is in fact part of my brain. This is the, the tools and mechanisms with which I think and understand and make sense of the world. And I uh, have made a point um, of using this material, these understandings in damn near every class I have ever taught since then. So it is a real pleasure and an honor to have uh, Professor Omi with us um, here today. He's going to talk, um, give a, a talk for about 40 minutes or so, um, and then we will, uh, 45 minutes, and then we will open up to questions, and the questions should, can range uh, really on any topic uh, from the census to racial formations to Asian American politics and beyond. So um, let me, uh, you know, ask you all to help welcome uh, Professor Michael Omi uh, while we, uh, you know, swap screens here. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Saru, for inviting me to this course. Um, and thank you for that really uh, more than generous introduction there. Where'd you get that picture? I didn't even see that picture of me and Howie Winant. Uh, it was pretty I, I, it's got to be at like the American <laughs> Sociological Association from oh. probably a few years back. I mean, I got it. Where else do you get it? I got it on Google. Ah, uh, all right. Well, yeah, I mean, you look great. I mean, you know. <laughs> some time ago. It was wonderful to be with you, and it was great. And and thank you again. My, Michael and I were swapping uh, our mutual appreciation of the clash and uh, the talking heads to begin with us to try and pick up the uh, appropriate theme song to, to segue into this lecture. Um, I'm going to share screen now and hopefully this will work um, and focus on my PowerPoint presentation.
Where do I want to start here? Actually, you know, 2020 is a, is a really big year, is a big year when the census is conducted. And I'm going to focus on the politics behind the racial and ethnic categories that are defined and collected by the census. Um, and from there, we could talk about an even more expansive notion about uh, race and politics. But first, let me briefly state why the census has always uh, been important. Get this. Uh, first of all, uh, the Constitution requires it, and it requires an actual enumeration uh, of every person every 10 years. In many ways, we might think of the census as a form of national accounting. It's something that provides a collective portrait of who we are as a people. Now we get into some of the other things which are very important about the census. It's about political reapportionment. And political reapportionment is really has become a zero sum game. And this is because the House of Representatives, uh, which from the beginning of the Republic kept expanding, growing larger, larger, larger. Finally, the House of Representatives was capped at 435 members after the 1910 census. And what that did in limiting the size of the house, it transformed reapportionment into a zero sum game. So that means whenever a state adds a house seat, another state loses a house seat. And since 1850, uh, California has generally averaged uh, two to three new house seats after each census, given the growth of the state of California. So that's one thing that's very important. People are very concerned about the census because it determines political apportionment within the House. The other part of this is that almost half of all federal spending is really allocated on a population basis. And these includes programs such as Medicare, highway planning and construction, education grants, and programs like Head Start. What this means is that the greater a nation, a state rather, undercount, the more federal funds the state loses. That's why there are millions and billions at stake to have an accurate count so that states can secure the, um, the degree of federal funding. And that's why there's such a concern among certain states about undercounts, because undercounts will cost them in these federal dollars. Now, since this 2020 has been particularly fraught and been in the political limelight for a number of reasons, many of you, many of whom you are probably familiar with. The first was this attempt by the Commerce Department um, and Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and the census is under the Commerce Department, by the way, wanted to add a citizenship question to census 2020. And Ross's original claim was that the question would be used in support of the Voting Rights Act. Well, what would be at stake in a census question? Well, by one government estimate, about 6.5 million people might decide not to participate in census 2020. And who might those people be? A lot of non-citizen, but also legal immigrant households. Initially, there was a district court judge, Jesse Furman, that found that if the question were added, that Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Texas would risk losing seats in the House, and that many, many states would lose federal dollars. Judge Furman also ruled that Ross's original claim that the question would be used to support the Voting Rights Act was probably not his real reason for the decision. And the Supreme Court subsequently ruled in June of last year that the Commerce Department decision to add a citizenship question to Census 2020 violated federal law. Thus, it was not on Census 2020. Uh, this was a last minute decision, by the way, and folks I knew in the Census Bureau told me they already had printings and drafts to go with the citizenship question. So it, uh, it, it was uh, a definitely a close call with respect to using that question on the census. Well, this hasn't stopped President Trump, however, uh, and he issued a, a directive in July 
uh, to, uh, for the federal government not to count undocumented immigrants when apportion, apportioning congressional house districts, the nation's house districts. Now, this would require some different statistical things uh, to get at this kind of data because there's no official tally exists and it conflicts with the constitutional requirement to count all persons, citizen and non-citizen alike. Now, this is still pending, but last week, just this last week, a federal court rejected his order because it violated the requirement in the Constitution to count all persons. And I'm not sure where it's going to go for there. Will it be subsequently challenged and whether or not the Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in on that. The other issue which is plaguing Census 2020 is the decision to end the census count early. In fact, because of COVID-19 pandemic and other concerns, um, the, the census count was originally extended to the end of October. But in fact, in a, in a recent ruling, um, the uh, Trump's administration wants to see the census count ending in September. Now, what this means is that there'll probably be millions and millions of, <clears throat> excuse me, households that will not be counted. And uh, there still is a struggle going on as to whether or not um, the census count will end in September, and also when, in fact, Congress will see the results of the census. So all I want to say in sketching this is that there's a lot of politics behind the census always, but particularly in this year, it's been particularly challenging to carry out a, a full and comprehensive census. Now this morning, I want to focus on the racial and ethnic categories used by the census and hopefully spur some conversation with you about their definition and use. And my conceptual frame is that of the theory of racial formation, which um, Michael Cohen has gone over and also uh, you've read some of this. So I, I won't belabor this too much. I just wanna make some, um, some points uh, to spur us along. Um, First and foremost, the notion of racial formation uh, asserts that race is a social construction. And by that, um, we're trying to critique conceiving of race as something that's fixed and static. And what this means is, and what we were trying to challenge within uh, mainstream sociology was to treat race as a kind of independent variable and, and talk about race and occupational status, race and incarceration rates, race and crime without, in fact, examining what we meant by race and how race was not a sat static thing, but was subject to kind of being constructed in a particular kind of manner over historical time. Um, go more on this, there's interesting debates within the kind of genomic sciences about this, but race, most people would assert, is not a biological or genetic category of human variation, but is a social category. And you could talk more about this as well. Um, race is a concept whose definition and meaning varies across time and place. By that is meant that depending on the particular historical period in question and the society in which concepts of race are embedded in, that it has a very definite kind of, of, of meaning uh, given its location in time and in space. Um, one could think about, uh, for example, colorism affecting this as well, the kind of expansion of, of uh, many kinds of, of racial categories, particularly um, in places like Brazil, from light to dark, you know, there's, there's the possibility, for example, of you and a sibling to be socially defined as different races, even though you share a similar set of biological parents. Um, now, this being said, that race is not fixed, race is not genetic or a uh, biological concept, does not mean that race doesn't matter. Social concepts of race do matter. They profoundly shape 
how we see our identities. They profoundly shape uh, racial hierarchy, the patterns of stratification, and the ways in which uh, outcomes, by individual and group outcomes there, are primarily, I mean, uh, inordinately shaped by the prevailing concept of race within a society. Just a few more comments about uh, racial formation. What is that? We might be able to see uh, racial formation then as this kind of process over historical time of race making, of how, uh, think about race now as how races are made, not how they are given, but how they are made. And the impact of those definitions of race throughout the social order. Now, race making is fundamentally a process of othering. It's defining and categorizing people as other, as the other. Now, defining groups of people as other is obviously not restricted to distinctions based on race, gender, class, sexuality, religion, culture, the list could go on, language, nationality, even age among other perceived differences, are frequently evoked to justify structures of inequality, to justify differential treatment, subordinate status, and in some cases are the reasons for violent conflict and war. Now, classifying people uh, by their perceived attributes is more or less a kind of universal phenomena, but what those categories are varies. And it's because as social beings, we utilize forms of classification to navigate in our social world, to discern who may be friend or foe, or to provide clues that guide our social interactions with the individuals and the groups we encounter. Um, I'll mention this, I wanna make a point before this, that it, it is in fact, think about how race is extremely important uh, even in our daily lives, that one of the first things we notice about a person, aside from the sex gender, is really their race. And we use notions that we have about race to give us clues about who this person is and how we should relate to them. And it's interesting too, because uh, when we encounter someone who we cannot place in a convenient racial category, it often becomes a source of discomfort and momentarily perhaps a crisis of racial meaning. And I know this from people who are quote unquote racially ambiguous or people of quote unquote mixed race heritage. Many of them say that they always asked who they are. And it's almost like, you know, if you cannot figure out what this person's racial identity is, it, 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 it's this source of, of, of discomfort. You gotta know in our society. Now that said, the very act of defining racial groups is a process that is fraught with a lot of confusion, contradiction, and unintended consequences. That in fact, racial boundaries or definitions change. Um, realignments become evident and new definitions of racial groups uh, come into being. I'm gonna start uh, the discussion about the census in particular with uh, how my own interests in particularly state definitions of race uh, came about. And this was from a case um, that emerged in the court in the 1980s, but it actually started in 1977. And in 1977, there was a woman named Susie Gilry Phipps, who was then 43 years old, who um, found herself in need of a birth certificate to process a passport application. My understanding of the story is that she'd never been out of the country. She never had a passport. And so she was gonna get a passport uh, to take a trip and she, need, she had to find her birth certificate and she could find her birth certificate. So believing all her life she was white, imagine Miss Phipps' surprise when a clerk at the New Orleans Division of Vital Records showed that on her new reissued birth certificate, she's gonna be designated as black. Believe me, she was white. Her new birth certificate says she's black. I love this quote from Ms. Phipps. She says, it shocked me. I was sick for three days. I was brought up white 
I married white twice. Now, what was interesting here at issue was in fact a 1970, and here I wanna be clear, I'm not talking 1790 or 1870 or whatever. 1970 Louisiana state law that allowed for anyone with more than 132nd black blood to be legally defined as black. And according to the state's genealogical investigation, Miss Phipps was found to be 332nds black, that she had a great, 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 I'm not sure how many greats you have to add, grandmother who was uh, a black woman slave named Margarita, and that Miss Phipps would be uh, legally defined as black. Uh, this went all the way to the Louisiana State Supreme Court and Ms. Phipps lost her challenge to it. The court says the Louisiana State had the right to uh, make these definitions. Uh, it, it's, it's no longer the case now, but it's an interesting one uh, in case you want to come back to that. Now, the designation of racial categories and the determination of, of racial identity is no simple task. And over the last several centuries, it certainly provoked numerous debates in this country about natural and legal rights, over who could become a citizen, and uh, even who could marry whom. It's worth remembering that it wasn't until 1952 that race could no longer be used to deny the right of a person to become a naturalized citizen. And it wasn't until 1967, as many of you know, in the Loving decision that the Supreme Court invalidated laws prohibiting the mar uh, interracial marriage, specifically the issuances of marriage licenses between whites and non-whites. 1967 is not that long ago. And in fact, these racial and ethnic categories have had these power uh, and has, have, have historically shaped the kind of political and social agendas of particular times. Now, what I want to show you now is that the categories themselves, oops, excuse me, have um, the racial terms that have been used in the census have varied enormously. In fact, there's practically been no two censuses that has used exactly the same uh, types of racial and ethnic categories. Um, this is a chart of the 20th century, um, which um, I got from sociologist Wren Farley. You could see here that in the 1900s, um, the only designators were black, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, and white. And by the 1980s, 1990s, you see um, a proliferation of other categories, particularly um, uh, Asian American categories, as well as uh, Pacific Islander categories. There's some curious ones here I want to point out that in regards to the census, Mexicans have only been regarded as a race once, and that was in 1930. And in fact, what happened after that is that they received numerous complaints from Mexican Americans to remove them as a separate race and also um, the Mexican government intervened and also said that it did not like Mexicans being coded as a race. Um, because before, up until that time, at least in the 20th century, um, Mexicans could be considered white. And this was in part, it's a longer history about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 following the Mexican-American War of Mexicans being allowed to become uh, in the territories which were seized from Mexico to become citizens of the United States. And I'll show you what happens to Mexicans as well as other uh, Latinx groups um, subsequently. Um, you'll find some other interesting features here too. The term Hindu in 1930 and 1940 um, was meant to capture the number of Asian Indians in the United States. What's interesting here is that um, Hindu uh, is, more or less a kind of religious category. And also South Asians in the United States, the vast majority of them at this point in time were in fact Sikh and probably secondly uh, Muslim. And so um, this kind of racialized uh, sort of kind of quasi religious kind of category um, is evident here. Um, 
And you'll see that, you know, there's these other ways in which um, categories have been strange, the use of just part Hawaiian in 1960. There's a lot of inconsistencies um, and interesting kind of quirks with respect to how these groups are assigned. Well, most of us deal with categories, racial and ethnic categories, that were established by the Office of Management and Budget in 1977 and revised in 1997. And I'm gonna show you that now. These are the direct, what are called the OMB Statistical Directive 15 categories. Um, and an interrogation, a look at their definition and meaning uh, reveals some problems in the way they're constructed. So first of all, look at this. What we have is um, uh, racial categories, American Indian, Asian, Black, Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander or white. And in fact, um, I, I, I'll go through this later, but in 1977, Asians and Pacific Islanders were in the same racial category, but revised in 1997. And then there's an ethnicity category. And here you have Latinx groups considered, Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, et cetera. Cubans twice, it was a mistake, uh, but this is the federal uh, record. Um, so in many respects, the federal government in ethnicity is only interested in if you are Latinx or not. And then there's these kind of, of, of racial groups, primary racial groups. Now, what this was designed for in 77 is to provide consistent categories for use by federal agencies. Um, and this is because different federal bureaucracies were using different racial and ethnic group coding, uh, the Veterans Affairs or, you know, Bureau of Economic stuff. So they wanted consistency. So they got together uh, to develop uh, the Directive 15 categories. Now, really these categories, which were used for federal agencies, had this unintended consequence of shaping the very discourse of race in the United States. In many respects, these constitute the basic food groups of American multiculturalism, if you will. And so um, the, these are the ways in which uh, uh, institutions operate. These are some of the ways in which uh, society as a whole has become uh, quote unquote color coded. Now, I'm gonna show you the questions that got asked in Census 2010. Some of you may have filled it out, many of you have not, or your families did uh, for you. So it asks two questions. One is on ethnicity and one is on race. So here as it says, uh, please answer both questions. Question one, is this person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? There are three basic subgroups, um, you know, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban. There's a write-in box. Then what is this person's race? It's white, black, American Indian, Alaska Native. Uh, to the left are Asian groups. To the right are Pacific Island groups. And there's a write-in box. And there's also an opening for some other race. You might want to look at this and think how you would identify yourself given the categories provided. And we could come back to this uh, later. Now, among other problems, there's really a gap between these state definitions and how individual groups uh, want to define themselves. So see that again? the state has one set of things, individuals may or groups may uh, not share in those definitions at all. They might not be meaningful to the very individuals or groups who they purport to represent. And there's differences in conceptualizing race, particularly for immigrants. So um, let me say one thing which is interesting. You read the piece, I believe, by Clara Rodriguez on, on uh, the sort of quote unquote Hispanic uh, categories and the problems with them. And let me say that's very, been very evident in, in the census. The census from about 1980 to the most recent one there's a number of uh, Latinx groups that don't answer these qu questions, come down to the some other race at the bottom 
and uh, fill in something. They say there's uh, Guatemalan. That they don't understand how they check off a ethnicity box and then a race box. Now, how would the census like to see this done? The census probably would like to see you done if you are a uh, very dark skinned Puerto Rican, for example, Puerto Rican, they'd like to see you check Puerto Rican and eight, come down to question nine and check off that you're black. Or say you're an extremely light skinned Argentinian. And actually there's a lot of Europeans in Argentina. So you would just check that you're Argentinian and then you would come down here and uh, check off you were white. But many people didn't get that or to understand that uh, difference. Um, so in fact, this chart shows this too, that when people were polled, um, two thirds of adults say that being quote unquote Hispanic is part of both of their racial and ethnic background. So both don't see this in a kind of compartmentalized fashion. And the census hasn't been able to sort of appropriately um, uh, capture that. All right. There are other issues as well. Um, that of the multiracial category. Now, for nearly a century, the census has assumed that um, each individual has a clear, singular, monoracial identity. Uh, earlier census enumeration schedules, by contrast, recognized um, some mixed race individuals. The 1890 census, for example, before the 20th century, listed mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, along with white, black, Chinese, Japanese, and Indian. Note too that Chinese and Japanese were earlier on considered two separate races. So what happened was that these mixed race categories eventually disappeared from the census. And what remained in place was a sort of one drop rule of racial descent. That meant any mixture between white and non-white gets you assigned to the other non-white uh, category or group. This logic, by the way, is pretty evident in the, even the 1960 census where census enumerators were instructed to um, that for persons of mixed race, white and non-white races, excuse me, report the race of the non-white parent. So there's always what is called uh, this kind of hypo descent rule. You always get assigned to the subordinate uh, racial groups. Mm. What changes a lot about this was beginning in the um, 1990s, um, there were organizations um, that protested this single race checkoff policy. And it mainly emerged from school districts, school districts that were um, attempting to, um, uh, were challenging the ways in which mixed race children had to pick uh, and select racial categories. You know, who do you like? today, your mom or your dad or something. Um, and so these uh, groups, such as the Association for Multi-Ethnic Americans and Project Race, I love that acronym, Project Race, it stands for Reclassify All Children Equally, um, actively lobbied for a multiracial category for Census 2000. Now, this became a highly contested political issue. And among other things, not at first, but slowly, most major civil rights organizations, such as the Urban League, the National Council of La Raza, which is an umbrella organization for 150 or so Latinx groups, along with groups such as the National Coalition for an Accurate Count of Asians and Pacific Islanders, opposed a multiracial category on the census. Uh, many of these groups feared a diminishment in their numbers and worried that uh, a multiracial category would um, spur debates about the protected status, if you will, of groups and individuals. Now think about what this means. You know, uh, according to various estimates, 75 to 90% of those who check the black box in the United States could potentially check off a multiracial one if it were an option. 
This did not mean that overnight the black population would disappear and become a multiracial population. But the, possible, the possibility of that existed, possible reduction in group numbers. And civil rights groups argued that existing federal civil rights laws and programs were based on exclusive membership in defined racial and ethnic groups, and that it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to assess what the salience of multiraciality would be in these laws and programs. So you have people advocating for a multiracial bo uh, box on the census and many civil rights groups, maybe the traditional racial and ethnic civil rights groups opposing it. Well, after several years of intense debate, uh, the Office of Management and Budget um, rejected the proposal to add a separate multiracial category. Instead, for Census 2000, they recommended that the racial categories um, uh, be amended to allow Americans to mark one or more racial categories when identifying themselves for the census and other government programs. And this was indeed adopted in Census 2000. So it's only since 2000 that you're able to check off more than one box. Previously to that, you couldn't. And here again, it really illustrates that uh, the census categories themselves are, are subject to political debate and contestation, and that these decisions have a, a political effect. Yeah, right. Let's see here. Oh, I should say that. Yeah, census 2000. Excuse me, I'm a little slow on marking that. Or mark one or check more than one box. Now, I'm going to show you something which I thought was going to be the form for Census 2020. And I, I say I thought. I thought I was convinced, in fact, this would be the format, and I was totally wrong. All right. Um, in February of 2017, the Census Bureau released the results of these tests it had been doing. They do really amazing tests. I mean, they do. They do focus group interviews. They tally various samples and, and whatever. Um, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to hang out at the Census Bureau for a little while. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it was so, it really convinced me. So there's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff, including they read a lot of stuff about race and ethnicity too. Um, so this is what I thought uh, based on what was called the 2015 National Content Test. And this was the uh, proposal, uh, what's called optimum, el optimal elements proposal um, that was issued in February of 2017. Again, I thought this was going to be it. Well, that's wrong. You'll see here that it does several things that's different. One is that um, the Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish question is no longer a separate question. It is folded into the questions about uh, race. So it's a combined race and ethnicity format. Second, you'll notice that um, it allows checkoffs, but it also allows people to do write-in for most of these major categories. In fact, we never had the opportunity to uh, do a white write-in box or a black write-in box, or have these boxes where people could check off that they were Polish, for example, or people could check off that they were Ethiopian or Haitian or Somali. Right? That was new for the first time. Uh, the other aspect of this is the addition of a Middle Eastern or Northern North African category. All right. And if you remember, in fact, um, we, you know, we don't, we don't have that. And in fact, uh, you know, the North Africans, many of these categories um, are supposed to identify themselves white under the current uh, sort of uh, categories. I, I, I won't go back to that thing, but uh, I'll show you that, in fact, that it was very interesting about the use of a Middle Eastern category. Um, Iranians in the last um, census, I believe, organized a write-in campaign that said, don't check that you're white, say you're some other race and write in that you're Iranian. 
So people have done different things to try to gain recognition and visibility within the context of the census. And this, the inclusion of a Middle Eastern category had been something that came up since the 1980s, but has never made it uh, to the census. All right. So uh, here it is, there's check boxes and open-ended responses. It combines the race and ethnicity question and it adds a Middle Eastern or North African uh, category. Now, that is not what Census 2020 was. And if you had to fill it out, this is what it looks like. It is, once again, a two-part format. First, we have a separate ethnicity question. Is this person Hispanic, Latino, or, uh, or Spanish origin? Same subgroups, although it has a write-in box uh, here too that provides examples to be, for example, uh, Ecuadorian or Colombian, et cetera. And then there's the race question. But here, there's a couple of things you should notice. One is there's no Middle Eastern or North African category. That was removed. But what it did preserve was some of these write-in boxes. No checkoffs of major categories, but it did give you examples. So under white, you could say you were Irish and Italian or whatever you want. Uh, under black, you could say you were Nigerian, you were Jamaican, et cetera. So it preserved that aspect of it and we'll have more detailed accounting of those subgroups. But in fact, um, the combined format and the addition of a Middle Eastern or North African category um, was taken out. All right. So the ever-changing sort of racial and ethnic definitions and categories used by the census uh, revealed the kind of social constructedness and the fluidity of race. And as I said, racial and ethnic categories can be seen as the effects of political interpretation and struggle. And in turn, the categories themselves have uh, political effects. And I wanna just um, follow up by talking briefly about what those political effects might be. Um, and I wanna talk about the uh, ideology of colorblindness. Uh, many people claim um, that they don't see race, that uh, people believe that the goals of the civil rights movement have been achieved, that racial discrimination is a thing of the past, and that we are now truly a colorblind society. Very hard to uh, come to grips with, given the particular uh, racial justice upsurge. Um, uh, um, that we're currently experiencing. But th there are people who, uh, you know, do say, oh, you know, I'm colorblind. I, I don't recognize a person's race. You know? uh, colorblindness denies that race informs our perceptions or it shapes our attitudes or influences our individual, collective, and institutional practices. Now, attended to this reigning ideology of colorblindness is the belief uh, that most, the most anti-effective Anti-racist gesture policy or practice is simply really to ignore race. We should ignore um, race. Um, and I mention this because it's fueled over the past several decades, a kind of concerted attempt by political conservatives to ban the use of racial demographic information. It's argued that government policies that draw upon or ask about racial categories are um, promoting race consciousness and subverting the ideology and practice of color blindness. Right. So what I wanna talk about in this last, just this last section is really how the very collection of racial data itself is being seen as a suspect by um, many political, conservative political elites um, that in fact uh, subverts what we should be, which is a colorblind society. Um, I wanna talk about an initiative that was back in 20, uh, 2003, excuse me. In October 7th of 2003, uh, Californians voted on an initiative, uh, Proposition 54, the so-called Racial Privacy Initiative. And um, 
Proposition 54 was sponsored by former University of California Regent Ward Connerly, who many of you know as one of the main architects of California's anti-affirmative action measure, Prop 209, and of Michigan's Proposal 2. Um, I think, in fact, Ward Connolly is, is back, in, back in the state lobbying against uh, California Proposition 16 on, on affirmative action. So he's, he's back again. But on this question, um, I'll show you. What Connolly wanted to do was add an article in the California Constitution that said that the state of California shall not classify any individual by race, ethnicity, color or national origin in the operation of public education, public contracting, or public employment. All right. Um, with this, let me say what, what classifying meant. Uh, he said, for purposes of this section, classifying by race, ethnicity, color, or national origin shall be defined as the act of separating, sorting, or organizing by race, ethnicity, color or national origin, including, but not limited to, inquiring, profiling, or collecting such data on government forms. Now, Connerly himself, this is modeled after the anti-affirmative action measures, by the way, in which you couldn't use race as the basis of, you know, uh, employment or admissions decision. Connerly steadfastly believes that the abolition of racial classification is essential for us to uh, realize a colorblind society. And you know, it's really interesting how many of these um, conservatives evoke, for example, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, talking about the day in which his children will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Of course, it misses the whole host of, of, of emphasis on inequalities, which still exist, which Dr. King talked about. Um, but it's very interesting. I, I, th I thought it was very interesting. Uh, uh, Michael Eric uh, Dyson uh, says that we should have a moratorium maybe on that speech because it's been usurped by political conservatives to, uh, to refute any sort of uh, progressive sort of um, piece of a racial uh, social policy. Um, here, I'll show you what he says. There's, there's Ward Connolly in his book, uh, My Fight Against Racial Preferences. Um, he wrote the argument in the state's voter pamphlet and he said, uh, dare we forget the lessons of history? Classification systems were invented to keep certain groups in their place and deny them full rights. Um, and he goes on actually to talk about how these categories have been used to uh, establish immigration quotas, how they've been used to, uh, you know, uh, create the absence, have the absence of rights to certain groups. I mean, you read it and you think, oh yeah, this is like, this is ethnic studies or something, you know. He also says that racial categories give credence to the dangerous view held by many that race is a fixed biological reality. So in fact, he's trying to work against the notion that race is biological too. If you don't dig deeper, um, Connolly's arguments sound very appealing on the face of it. But what he fails to distinguish is the historical use of racial classification before the civil rights era and after the civil rights era. Because prior to the passage of civil rights legislation in the 1960s, census categories were used, he's right, to politically disenfranchise and discriminate against groups defined as non-white. From prohibitions on naturalization rights to the setting of quotas for the 1924 National Origins Immigration Act, census categories were defined and strategically utilized to circumscribe the political, economic, and social rights of specific racialized groups. But what he doesn't think about is after the passage of civil rights laws, census data, data by race and ethnicity, has been used to discern patterns of discrimination practiced by businesses, schools, and other political institutions against people of color and other disadvantaged minorities. And thus data by race became absolutely critical for the enforcement of every civil rights law passed since the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The point here is that the civil rights era marked an important shift 
in the use of racial and ethnic data, from a tool being used to exclude groups to one to, to sort of measure and discern patterns of discrimination and ensure the inclusion and adequate representation of groups. The point is, is that we simply cannot abolish forms of racial classification. The reality is that without some form of racial data, without some form of racial record keeping, we're unable to empirically observe um, patterns of institutional inequality with respect to people's incomes, educational opportunities, uh, access to healthcare, wealth, among other important indicators of well being and life chances. Empirical studies on racial inequality or disparities uh, really illustrate the need for race data. Consider, for example, that the Institute of Medicine study unequal treatment found that, that even if you controlled for insurance coverage and ability to pay, there were stark inequalities by race in terms of diagnostics, preventative care, and treatment, no matter what the disease in question was. In one study they cover uh, of 1.7 million patients, Blacks received major therapeutic procedures less often than whites in 37 out of 77 medical conditions. Another example, though the Fair Housing Act of 1968 made it illegal for lenders to use race as a basis for lending decisions, it was not until data collection laws were passed in the 1980s that lending patterns could clearly be discerned. So here's the problem. You pass a law making it illegal for mortgage lenders to use race as a basis uh, for lending. But unless you have data collection laws that allow you to look at the patterns, what, what are these mortgage lenders doing? Uh, you couldn't figure out what was going on. And what was found in the 1980s, of course, was that the loan rejection rates were twice as high for blacks as it was for whites, even if they shared similar income portfolios. So the point being is that uh, the lending decisions were in fact influenced by race. All right. Um, these examples illustrate the need to um, maintain some form of racial classification and racial data, but it does not mean that we can have accurate, precise, or scientific racial classifications. These things are social, they're defined through policy, and they're going to be defined in that manner going forward as well. We're never going to have a stable set of racial classifications for a now and forever that could guide this. But what is important is to think about the issues that are going on, to think about the inequalities or problems that are being generated, and think about the kinds of policies that we would want to use to ameliorate uh, some of the more glaring instances of institutional inequality. But the point being is we cannot have fixed, firm racial classifications. That said, in a racially stratified society, social concepts of race very much do matter. Right. Um, during the uh, Proposition 54 debate, by the way, Connolly lost that one. And there's an interesting story about you know, how that, that got defeated as well. But um, nonetheless, during that debate, Ken Pruitt, who was the director of the Census Bureau for Census 2000, sent me a short piece he wrote on the Racial Privacy Initiative. And he said, um, I'm happy to join Ward Connerly in welcoming a colorblind society, but I don't want to be blindfolded as it arrives. And I think he's quite right. And I'm going to stop right there and really, um, Hope to hear your questions and comments. Great, thank you very much. That was uh, remarkably clear. I think you get this the, the clear sense of the census as you know. I would offer the, the the census as racial project and the ways in which we think of the the shift, particularly in the civil rights era, right?
um, of the purpose of the census. It goes from, as you suggest, a system of exclusion and of discrimination to a necessary category uh, of inclusion and equality under law. And I think it goes to ask, you know, the basic question of, well, why does the government, and I'll just let, you know, let you sort of continue on this question, but like, why does the government need to know what race we are? Why, why is that like, even to go as far back, you know, to the 1790s, you know, why does the government need to know what race we are? Mm -hmm. That's a great, great question, Michael. And let me say, that's the kind of question people ask during the Proposition 54 debate. They say, why does the government have to know my race? My race should be my private thing and nobody else's, you know? That's why it was known as the Racial Privacy Initiative. Um, but the point being is that from the very inception of the Republic, um, these categories made sense as to, um, um, you know, reflect uh, people's uh, status in the United States, you know? Who would be declared to be, um, in 1790, 1790 uh, passed the uh, Naturalization Act. It defined who could become a naturalized citizen of the United States. You had to be here for a resident of, I can't remember, at least three, five years. You had to uh, have witnesses to say you were of good character. You had to be seen as that you would not be a drain on the state's welfare. But in fact, what it, what it also said was, in order to become a naturalized citizen of the United States, you had to be white. And if you weren't white, you wouldn't be. Or think about the ways in which blacks are counted as three-fifths, slaves is counted as three-fifths persons uh, for a long period of time. In other words, from the very inception of the country, um, racial categories mattered as to where you, you ended up in the kind of uh, uh, social hierarchy, if you will. Um, and it determined a number of other things about who could come into the country, who could not, for example. Um, passage of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act was based on the first time we decided there's one group we're gonna exclude entirely. So these categories become used for federal policy in a variety of ways um, to exclude people, to, to deny them rights and privileges, and to, in many cases, get rid of them. Um, and so just to f further that the question then why, uh, you know, I, I, why can't, well, so I have, what I have up here is the racebox.org website here, which um, was created by a, a, a mutual student of ours, Josh Bagley, um, at one point. And then these are the, the racial category, you know, the census race box so all the way back. And, and th there's some interesting ones here, like 1910, 1900, where they, they just seem to, they don't actually offer categories. And so one of the, the questions I have is, well, why can't the census just let us make up our own categories? Like, why doesn't it use race box and just have it be blank and let us define ourselves? Well, yeah, that's, a, uh, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, I'm going to say two things to this. One is the Census Bureau has a book listing almost a thousand racial and ethnic categories in it. Uh, and so if somebody marks in some of the race some strange thing, um, you know, I think there was something like Weasord or something. Some of these things sound like from Dr. Seuss, I, I, as I remember that. But there's these small categories of people who have defined themselves, maybe, you know, in a rural setting, and some are multiracial, too. Um, uh, they, they, they do have these categories, and they can code you up into that. Um, and I'm going to show you this other thing, which people at the Census Bureau told me, which was that one of the, in uh, Census 2000, one of the, um, you know, some of the race, uh, something like 94, 97% of those who checked off some of the race were some Latinx group. But what was one of the, uh, one of the largest ones, I don't know if it was second largest one, that people had written for some of the race was Jedi. And it was right during, I think, some of the uh, Star Wars reboot or something like that. But um, it was just hilarious that people wrote in. So we got a lot of Jedi in the United States, which we don't realize. But the, the, the point I'm making about this is that um, we, we are under now at least part, uh, a, a self-definition mode. So in other words, you can define yourself however you want to. Prior to this, it wasn't until 1960 or maybe 1970 that um, 
Before then, census takers came to your door and looked at you and coded you. And if there's any ambiguity, they ask you questions or they may ask you your race or something like that. But somebody else was coding you by race. Now it's all by self-definition. So there is slippage there too. I mean, I know personally a, a terrific guy. He's a community organizer in Chicago uh, who's white who uh, puts himself down on the census as being black in order to increase the numbers of, of blacks in his census track. I know another woman who is in fact um, was a um, actually racially mixed woman, black and white, who uh, put down that she's a Native American and put down the tribe she had studied. So, uh, you know, people fudge this a lot, you know, but but most people are trying to give some sort of accounting. And you're right, I mean, it could be open-ended, but the, the, the state is trying to make sense of these large collectivities, basically, to define them in some ways. Um, and they're always asking questions about this in order to uh, get at this data in a way that's much more comprehensible towards those people they're trying to trace. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I would love to see the list of the thousand <laughs> racial yeah, categories. You could get a hold of that book. It's on. Okay, I'll look for it. Um, but get, part of it is that the, you define racial formations as the, the the ways in which racial categories are created, inhabited, transformed, and destroyed. And it's always the kind of trivia contest about the the extinct races of America. The, what does it mean to destroy a racial category? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. is a kind of fascinating concept. Um, it also makes me think of this uh, recent study I read about race in Brazil, which is one of the most racially complex societies on earth and that when you go about asking people what kind how they self-identify you you get literally thousands of categories of people will define themselves as not white or blue in moonlight or the category that was my favorite was the disappearing donkey which is impossible. <laughs> racial category in Brazil. It's just incredibly prolific versions of these kinds of definitions, but that can exist only because Brazil officially claims to have no racial categories, right? Exactly. exactly. So when you get outside the US, this changes really quite dramatically. It changes a lot. For example, France does not ask about race in its census, you know? And so it claims that what's, what's important is that who is uh, a French um, citizen, and what that's uh, fostered in fact, and, and so this is always my example. Uh, you know, people say, well, you know, let's get rid of the racial categories on the census. Maybe then we wouldn't have such uh, racial turmoil in this country. Well, France doesn't ask about race in its census and one certainly can't say there's no racial turmoil in France. In fact, what's really sad is that I understand there's uh, like community-based organizations in France that are trying to do their own census to figure out particularly, you know, people from North Africa or some other places um, who live in much more impoverished conditions, but don't have the data to be able to, uh, to do that. I, I should also mention, as you look at this chart too, is the ways in which, um, if you look at some of these things at, uh, at a local level, at a local scale, like Philadelphia or New York or something like that, uh, the ways in which uh, uh, until, quite later on, um, there's different white racial groups or, or, or groups that were defined separately become white. For example, the how the, Noel Ignati of the historian has a great book on how the Irish became white. You know, that I, you know for a long period, oh, you got that, <laughs> okay. You know, um, whiteness itself gets constructed over centuries from uh, variegated groups that are not considered uh, white. The Irish were subject to extraordinarily uh, exploitative and discriminatory situations, you know? But um, th this is the question about how races get made, how races get formed in, over the course of, of, of years. Right, the Hibernian is no longer a recognizable racial category. <laughs> Hibernian. <laughs> the, the, the Irish American, it, it certainly is. Um, let me, I'll, I'll pitch this last question and then we'll turn to the students here. And, and I want to go back to the beginning where you talked about the politicization of the census, because one of the things I really want you to help me understand is 
right, what does Trump and the Republican Party and Wilbur Ross and others, what do they hope to achieve by sabotaging the U.S. Census? Why does it matter to those of us in, say, California if we get our count right, but people in Texas, Arkansas, and Missouri do not? Uh, how does this harm us in California if Missouri is undercounted? How does that advantage supposedly, you know, Trump and the Republicans? Yeah, the problem is, is that probably who would be subject to uh, uh, the sort of um, the more pernicious effects of an undercount are a state quite like ours, you know, uh, California, which has a significant uh, immigrant and undocumented population. But it would also affect um, other states as well. Um, Texas and Florida, for example, which also have large immigrant and undocumented populations in them. So it's kind of interesting. It's not exactly a blue state, red state thing, but um, certainly what they're hoping to do was, um, you know, particularly with this last move of trying to remove the count of, of, of um, undocumented immigrants from the roles in terms of house reapportionment is really to um, create a, across the board a, a much more favorable um, you know, favorable political geography uh, for the Republican Party is, 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 is what they're trying to do. But also by hammering at this, it sort of brings in the theme of the kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric that's been going on as well. So I think there's a couple of things going on. I mean, what you said about, well, if we get our count right and the other states don't, what's the problem? The problem is, is that most of these directives affect us as a state uh, impact us, it would pr probably impact us more than the state of Wyoming, for example, or Montana. And thus, uh, it would cost us not only in terms of political representation, but the federal dollars which flow from that. And so uh, getting, that's why there's so much money that's being spent in a state like ours to get people to fill out the census, you know? But it's been particularly challenging um, uh, for census takers to go door knocking. And, and uh, here's, here's what's a, a nightmare scenario, is that if some reason, when the census counts get delivered to Congress or something, it is also seen as so fundamentally flawed as to raise a whole host of, of perhaps at this point, unanswerable political questions about uh, the legitimacy of the census itself. Uh, great, Th thank you. That that is uh, that it's super helpful. Uh, this was a this was a major question I had. Um, let me uh, turn to we're gonna uh, turn to to Karen who's gonna ask a couple of questions that appeared in the chat, and then we'll turn to Dominic who will uh, will uh, go for the the first hand. So let me go to Karen first, and then um, uh, we'll we'll move down. So go ahead, please, Karen. Um, hi everyone. I see a question from Allison. Allison, you wanna ask your question? Hi, yeah, so my question was, um, is like the possibility of like having that different ethnic box in the race box motivated by, um, I don't know, the attempt to keep white as the majority. So by forcing almost, or like by not giving the option to have Hispanics have their own separate race, but have to like fall under the white category and even like Middle Eastern people have to choose white. Is that motivated by trying to keep white the majority in America. And then that would also bring up the questions of why is it such a big issue if white isn't the majority in America, right? So. Yeah, good, great question, Allison. Um, I, I don't think it's primarily motivated by that, uh, by the way. I think what's, um, what's, what's um, but it certainly feeds into that in, in certain ways. I mean, these categories, and maybe I didn't convey this enough, um, they are imposed from above, but they're politically contested from below as well. So folks are always trying to uh, gain uh, recognition. Um, I have an ex-student of mine who's been lobbying for a separate Taiwanese category outside of the China Chinese category, for example, and that would raise a whole host of, of foreign policy considerations and other things. So no, I don't think it's used um, to inflate the uh, white population of the United States, although um, um, 
if you look at that, um, if you look at any federal data statistics, you'll see this curious thing. It'll say the number of non-Hispanic whites reporting. And what it does is subtract out people who had filled out white and the Hispanic uh, you know, a Hispanic category. So there are attempts, in fact, to um, get at that as well. Um, I don't think that works as well for groups who are, would be considered in the uh, proposed Middle East and North African category. But at least in that one, there is an attempt to sort of um, parse or separate out uh, those kinds of categories. So you'll see, you'll, you'll see that in a lot of federal reporting. And I think if they weren't interested in that, they would just tell you the number of whites you know, but they're trying to break it down um, and separate out those who had also claimed that they were uh, Latinx in, in some fashion. I hope that answers it. So I don't think it's a, an intentional move. Okay. No, that's very helpful. I mean, I'm just looking at the data that I collected from 2019 that says that 76% of the American population identifies as white. But if you take the people who check white alone, that's only 60.1%. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that that's some that might be something else because checking white alone is um, separate from those who did um, um, multiple checkoffs. So each group say, if you look at the number of um, um, Japanese in the United States, it'll give you the number of Japanese in the United States and the number of people who check Japanese alone. Uh, but there's another thing too uh, that that I was talking to Allison about was that that separating out those whites who um, had also checked off his, his, the Hispanic category. That it often says, if you look at data on the bottom of tables, it does say non-Hispanic whites a lot too, which is, which is a little different. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you, it's super clarifying. Okay, so let's turn to, uh, to Dominic. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, hi, I had a question that was, uh, I just kind of wanted to add it on to uh, Professor Cohen's uh, question about the intentions of the Republican Party. Um, earlier, you mentioned that it is within the Constitution that all citizens, uh, all people be counted for apportionment, and, and this equates to uh, representation in the Congress, and then from there, that equates to dollars given to for resources and everything else, which is, it seems like that's the fundamental reason why we have that amount of representation, so we get that, that amount of money funneled to the areas that need it the most. So with that being said, do you think that part of challenging that and part of asking the citizenship question is also an attempt to get rid of other umbrella uh, constitutional amendments that apply to everyone in, in the country uh, rather than just citizens, for instance, the 14th Amendment, which is in fact an umbrella uh, amendment? Yeah, Dominic, I think it, it is part of that. For, first, let, let me say there, there, I, there should be some separation here. The logic is not that if you get the political representation, then you'll get the federal dollars. That often the federal dollars are pegged to uh, population counts. So you might get that even if you, know, you don't get an extra house person. So um, th there is a relationship, but it's not like that's, you know, in other words, you got to get the reps in order to get the money, federal monies to come to you, but it's part of it. So on this other thing, is it part of a sort of larger uh, project to sort of uh, restrict, if you will? Is, is that the, the, the sense of, of who the kind of um, political subjects, who are, the, who are the citizens, in fact? That, I think, is right that I think it is attempting to say, well, you know, we have these undocumented populations, they shouldn't count. They shouldn't count in terms of like the distribution of either the federal dollars or in terms of the numbers for political reapportionment. Because, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, they don't vote or, you know, they did. In other words, it's supposed to count everybody and it's supposed to be used to determine um, uh, the kind of, of seats in the house. Now, and I think it's, it's, it's uh, harking back to a much more uh, restrictive uh, kind of agenda with respect to immigrants. Now, you know what a lot of people have been trying to pass, I mean, and people try to pass this since the 19th century, is the kind of uh, shifting the uh, birthright citizenship in the United States about being, uh, you know, born on this soil. 
as, as many of you know, you know, um, the United States is anybody born on U.S. soil can claim U.S. citizenship. That's uh, just soleil as a person, just sangui by blood. So, I mean, many other countries, you could be born on their soil, it doesn't make you a citizen of that country. So people have been trying to revise this, uh, particularly, um, uh, as you know, for, uh, and, and I think at one point Trump was very interested in this, is that having people, if your parents are undocumented uh, and you're born here, you shouldn't be a citizen of the United States. Uh, that would require uh, a constitutional amendment. I think that's really hard to get, but it's, it's an interesting thing for uh, here again to disenfranchise or to really say there's certain people who shouldn't be here and they shouldn't be counted and they shouldn't have any sort of political rights uh, given that. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go to, to Sam Radcliffe. Um, hi, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Professor Elmi um, for everything that, uh, that you've said. It's been a really interesting lecture. Um, but I just wanted to talk about, um, in the past I've heard suggestions that potentially um, moving away from like, a person-to-person -person count by moving to something like a mathematical model or something along those lines. Um, I've heard it argued that that would be a more accurate count of people. Now, whether or not that's constitutionally viable is a different question, but um, does that, um, what do you think about that argument that like using a model be more accurate and does that, um, does that sort of go against using the census in a way to help um, target issues of inequality and find, uh, like you said, um, like difference in lending practices, stuff like that. Does it, does it hamper those efforts? Hmm. Interesting. That's an interesting question, Sam. Let me say first, that's a bit of a technical question that's a little out of my orbit, but I'm going to say this about it anyway, which is that actually the census does engage in those kinds of statistical things as well. So when it actually can't get the hard fast data off of number 23 on Maple Street, it imputes a lot of stuff from the surrounding neighborhood and community. There are statistical things which are done to uh, round things off, all right? So already that is done. Now you can't do that, however, on a large scale. I think that would violate the, um, the mandate behind the uh, census and the, and the ways in which to do that. But, um, uh, and I don't know what it would mean to do that on a more large scale basis. I think there's going to be those kinds of practices to round off or to impute um, with the delivery of Census 2020, because there were so many households that won't have the opportunity or didn't um, choose to participate in the census that we just don't have information for. So we're going to see that. Now, um, then it becomes political about you got to throw those out because you, you're, you're just guessing as opposed to you, you have the art for data. So there's going to be kinds of those um, tug and pulls about both the te technical issues involved and about the undercount that I think are going to really plague 20, uh, Census 2020 on the other end. I hope that kind of addresses what you're asking, Sam. Uh, it's yeah, a good, yeah. and it's, good, it's a good question. I, it, there's another one that has come up in the chat a couple of times that I just think would be, you know, the, the, the mathematical modeling may be an attempt to sort of depoliticize the census. Is there, is there any way to depoliticize the census or is this just always going to be with us? I think it's always going to be with us, you know, um, despite the kinds of sophistication with the kinds of various uh, tech, techniques. You know, this was the, um, I believe this was the first census in which people could, uh, fill it out uh, via the internet, you know, which raises a whole host of other questions, you know, who has internet access, who can do this and who can't. But um, nonetheless, I, th I think um, this, these kinds of issues, uh, the statistical stuff is always going to um, be with us where, you know, and it's just this political crisis uh, about the census is happening right in the midst of where the pandemic has made it really difficult for census workers who are trying to follow up on those households who haven't um, filed the census um, to um, do their work. It's, it's, it's a, like a perfect storm. Um, so I, I'll call on someone else, but I would ask if, any, if anyone out there has worked 
as a census taker, I would ask you to, to raise your hand and maybe you could share some experience with that if any of you have, uh, or you put it certainly like a volunteer in the chat or write me in the chat and I, I can I'll ask you, uh, see if you can ask a question. But let me turn to, to Sarah. Hi, thank you. First, Professor Omi, I just wanted to thank you as well for being um, with our class today and for your presentation. It was a really nice update to the reading that we had this week of your piece on um, racial formation. Um, and so my question kind of touches on something that you were just talking about, um, but it's kind of a macro question. Last week, we read a piece by Barbara Fields where she addressed the ideology of race. And I just was interested in hearing your thoughts on whether there is value in or whether it's worthwhile um, to entertain like an idea <clears throat> of progressing towards a less racially stratified society or or a move away from a dependence upon even having racial categories like we all sort of are acknowledging mm -hmm. that it's a social construct um you know but as you just commented it's something that is always you know maybe always going to be with us but um just whether it's worthwhile to sort of have that as something that we want to move towards or whether that's even relevant to, mm -hmm. to having the conversation so that's a great question, Sarah, a real cosmic one here, you know. Um, let me say this, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, I, I, I still do, you know, uh, I, it's sort of like that Ken Pruitt quote, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to have a colorblind society, I just don't want it to be blindfolded <laughs> until it arrives. It's, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, I think that um, we do want to aspire to, uh, you know, the notion of the, the beloved community, you know, or, or, or notions in which um, the kinds of patterns of racial stratification and inequality uh, don't exist. And I think, you know, that's, uh, I, I certainly, there's a lot to work against this. I mean, you know, Derek Bell talks about the permanence of racism. Um, you know, some of the uh, Afro pessimists uh, writing is is definitely in in a vein to to um, suggest the inescapability of some of this stuff. I mean, I think what it is 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 being able to think about um, uh, envisioning, working towards, uh, and 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 um, thinking about those kinds of um, well, at this point perhaps utopian visions of what we'd like to see, while at the same time being extremely cognizant of the ways of the institutional practices of the kinds of systemic ways in which were, um, uh, th that are sort of generating massive amounts of inequality and, and, until we're there. It's really hard to maintain that. It's really hard to look at that vision of, of what we, could be, you know? I mean, it's hard to imagine the United States as a kind of raceless society, if you will, where race doesn't matter, or where it doesn't matter to the degree that it determines where you live, what kind of health care you receive, what kind of education you have, and, and whether or not, uh, it, you know, how that determines your encounters with the police. So, um, I don't know if I answer that. It's, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. I guess I'm saying both, you know? It's like not being naive about what we have now and to think about uh, what we would want uh, going forward. And I mention this because I think there's a lot of uh, students who believe like, oh, if I'm just colorblind, that's, that's the answer to this, you know? I don't care if a person I mean, I don't care if they're black, white, Yellow, they just sort of throw in other colors too, green, purple. I treat all people the same. We don't, you know, and, and we have to acknowledge the ways in which race is not only embedded in our institutions, but the way in which it really shapes our practices uh, every day in everyday life. Yeah, I, I, just to echo that, I think it's a very good answer. And it's a great question. Uh, I mean, in, in my sense, I mean, we in the United States of America are a, a society structured in dominance. And that dominance is more often than not articulated through racial categories and classifications and hierarchies. And the suggestion that we could somehow abolish or ignore the existence of race under these situations would, 
have the effect of disabling uh, uh, various uh, racial others from organizing and uh, advocating on their own behalf. It would, it have, you know, to, it, it's an attractive notion, particularly to conservatives. They're embraced uh, uh, colorblindness because the idea would be to fix the sort of racial dynamics in its present state, which to certain folks, rich white conservatives is hugely advantageous, but to uh, poor people of color, it's a, a you know a complete disaster. So the sense that we, you know would be to say that could we eventually imagine the idea of the abolition of racial categories? Sure, but only once. I think, in my sense, is once we've abolished racism itself. And if we, you know, I think that that in order to and you know this is the Ta-Nehisi Coates line, which is to say that you know that race is is um, is not the that racism is the father of race, not uh, not the sun, right? That racism comes before the category of race in terms of its historical construction. That's what Barbara Fields, in fact, argues. Uh, and in order to get rid of race, we have to get rid of racism first. Uh, and it makes me think about, you know, the, the stuff I ran around collecting in the 1990s, this uh, zine, um, uh, that was called Race Trader that I was particularly obsessed with uh, in the 1990s that the, whose slogan was at, you know, about abol the abolition of whiteness and the treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity as a kind of slogan. And I well, always sort of took taken that in, you know, in a sense that like whiteness really is the, you know, as long as there are people who identify as white and assume and accept and insist on those privileges, it's going to be very hard for people who are not white to embrace the idea of ra you know, abolishing racial categories. But that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let me uh, turn to uh, Vivek. Hi, Professor Omi. I just had a question uh, about the law as broad as that is. Like in particular in the Phipps, uh, the Phipps case, it was the law that defined her, uh, her race and whether she was afforded like privileges of whiteness, but by any other means she was white. So I guess my question is, how has the legal system led to the formation of race in America? And, as, and by this means, like is the, is, uh, the, is the law as a racial project stronger than other institutions? Mm, good question. Is the law as a legal, it certainly is a, an extremely fundamental one. I'm not sure if I'd say it's uh, it is more important than others, but um, it, it certainly has these determinant aspects of assigning certain kinds of rights and privileges, particularly when, they're, when they've been challenged, you know? Let me say this really briefly about the uh, Phipps case. Um, you know, what was interesting about it, it was in 19, uh, you know, it, it, uh, the 1970 Louisiana law was based on, interestingly, a package of civil rights reforms that prior to this, a, the child's race at birth was to be uh, written by whoever assisted in the birth, a midwife, a physician, whatever, would look at the baby and say, this baby is. And the state said, hey, that's really subjective. And as many of you know, if you've seen newborn babies, we come into this world looking a lot more alike than I'm sure <laughs> many of us want to conceive. So, um, the, the, they said, no, we have to have an objective standard and let's, let's, let's pick it. How about 132nd? You know, it's more precise than a kind of one drop rule. So it had this kind of determinant quality to it. But all these laws, in fact, um, for many people who wanted to gain rights and privileges, they had to, um, if you will, aspire to whiteness. Um, the famous, um, Ozawa case uh, in the in, in, in the 1920s was about um, a, a Jap Japanese man who you know went to UC Berkeley, uh, you know, spoke English, was Christian, blah blah blah. Uh, argued that in fact he the uh, the uh, people of Kyoto are whiter than these uh, these uh, Polish and Italians and, you know, others who were in this country to begin with, is trying to make a claim so that I should become, he said, a naturalized citizen in the United States. And the, the court rejects that argument, as it does in the Thin decision in 19, um, what was it, 23, I believe, in which a Sikh man seeks to become a citizen of the United States on the basis that uh, Asian Indians are Caucasian by the prevailing, um, then prevailing anthropological wisdom. And the Supreme Court decides in that case in a fascinating decision, says that he is Caucasian, 
by some prevailing anthropological definition, but he's not white by what a common person on the street thinks a white person should be. So uh, all I'm saying, and this is a roundabout way to get, get at your uh, question, Vivek, but what I'm trying to say here is that, yes, the law plays a real determinant role in not only codifying some of these racial categories, but also in many respects, um, enforcing the color line about rights and privileges that are based on assignment according to those um, laws. Um, there's a, a bunch of books that are, are, are interesting to read about this, including um, our colleague on campus, Ian Haney Lopez's book, uh, White by Law, oh, which... I um, have right here, <laughs> White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez. Yes, yeah, so, no, I was, exactly, thank you, yeah. He will be a speaker for us uh, soon. Oh, good. Vivek, I, ask him that question when he comes. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> We're going to be talking about other things, but that, I mean, exactly, the Bugatz and Thin case and all of these cases in the early 20th century in which various ethnic groups attempted to claim whiteness, right, because of the 1790 Naturalization Act. I mean, I think Professor Omi's answer is quite quite good there. So let's, um, I want to turn to, to Ailey. She's going to ask the next question, and then I'll, I, I want to try and get you, Michael, if you don't mind, to, to say a little something about scientific racism, and then I have a last question that I think we can round things out with. So, Ailey? Hi, Professor. Thank you. Um, my question actually comes from a passage from the reading we did this week of your book about students of different racial groups talking past each other in the classroom mm -hmm. uh, due to a common, a lack of common sense understanding of race where white students adopted colorblindness and non-white students assumed that because racism is about power, they can't be racist. So I guess it's a two-part question. Do you think that this problem is still as rele relevant or persistent as it was when you first published the book? And if so, how do we rectify that lack of common sense, common sense understanding specifically within the classroom? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think we took that passage from um, some work that was done by a, a great sociologist on campus who, who passed away some years ago, Bob Blauner, um, who talked about two languages of race in the classroom. And I actually think much of that still holds to today that, you know, um, that in fact, um, it becomes difficult to have those conversations. And this is not to say it's difficult among all white students or all students of color or something like that, but it certainly is the case that there tends to be a kind of, um, much more of a kind of default position in which um, um, white students can, and here I'm not trying to indict everybody, white students can adopt the uh, position that we should all, that I'm colorblind and that, you know, this. I mean, it's the same thing where people say um, in response to the um, BLM that all lives matter. It's kind of like, you know, you, you don't get it, that, that in fact, the kinds of exceptional ways in which uh, black lives, black bodies have been devalued. And then, what you have on the other end is students of, uh, uh, of color oftentimes thinking, well, um, you know, you can't be racist if you don't have power. But that sort of skirts a lot of issues too. That yes, in the broadest sense, in terms of like uh, macro level, structural level uh, things, uh, that, that is indeed true. But it doesn't mean that you don't have uh, power and localized power which in, in certain kinds of more local settings uh, can play out in, in ways that um, um, uh, sort of dis can, can disadvantage other groups. Let me give you an example, uh, and I'm trying to pull from something here, is um, it's really interesting the patterns of multiracial collaboration or conflict that have gone on in places like Oakland as opposed to um, Miami, Florida. Um, for long periods of, of time here in Oakland, and this was more or less true in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, that uh, there were um, black elites who uh, occupied, you know, the mayoral slot and and had significant degree of power. And in fact, many folks in the Latinx and Asian communities felt that they were being disenfranchised and not incorporated in that, uh, in the to in in terms of the uh, resources and access to uh, city hall power, power or something. Whereas in, in Miami, for a long time, they, uh, there's Cuban elites, for example, 
who have disenfranchised a lot of the local sort of not only black population, but Afro-Caribbeans as well uh, from, from access to that and uh, access to resources as well as the distribution of power. What I'm saying is that on a local level, this could play out differently in which groups of color can wield uh, a certain degree, a modicum of power. And to say you have no power, uh, I think is really disingenuous. That in fact, um, it, it's, it's too easy a formula to say, well, I can't be racist because I have no power. Uh, we do have power. It might not be uh, a very limited forms of power, but in fact, uh, so what I'm saying is I'm sort of indicting both sides of that claim. But I think people do adhere still to those positions. And as a consequence, it makes arguments or discussion, dialogue about race, about racism, extremely difficult, extremely difficult, even in the classroom setting, you know? And folks are, you know, necessarily, I mean, not necessarily, but folks um, are right uh, to uh, feel uh, either disempowered or vulnerable in those situations to have a very real dialogue about that. Great. Um, let me just actually, in the time that we have left, I mean, thank you all for your very thoughtful questions. These have been, this has been, a, a, I think, a really terrific discussion. And just as a way of ending with Professor Omi here, I, I want to put uh, put him on the spot a little bit and just <laughs> ask, and ask you what you think in particular is at stake in this election. And and more directly, if you could speak to it, I would ask you to, to what is at stake in this election, particularly for Asian Americans? Oh. Uh, as an electorate, as a, as a community, um, uh, and in, in terms of, you know, not just how they intend to vote, but what, what the consequences for this broad and diverse community might be um, in this election. Oh, uh, wow. That's a lot. All right. Um, minutes at the most. <laughs> are you going to have Professor Teku Lee come at some point in time? You should get <laughs> in political science who uh, studies about uh, voting behavior, voting patterns among Asian Americans. Um, What's at stake in this upcoming election is, is certainly what we've seen is this kind of, um, um, well, let me, let me speak to the last question, uh, the, the latter part of that question first, and then maybe we could double, double back around this. I think um, there's a couple of things going on among Asian American communities, which is very interesting. The recent kind of data I've seen is in fact um, a real much more solid, um, democratic move than we've seen in decades, you know? And before this, there used to be really splits between uh, Asian ethnic groups in particular. You had maybe uh, Japanese being extremely democratic, um, Vietnamese, other Southeast Asian groups uh, uh, veering towards uh, the Republican Party. But from the last, last data I've seen, there's been sort of consistent trend lines, uh, movements towards support for the uh, democratic uh, party. So I'm going to assume that uh, many Asian American voters across different and diverse Asian ethnic groups um, are actually going to be voting Democratic. What's, what's at stake with respect to this thing? Uh, several issues. Um, one is um, for Asian Americans, their entire growth, uh, particularly since the passage of the 1965 uh, uh, immigration reform bill, which later led to a huge expansion. I mean, between, you know, um, I forgot what the years were, but I think Asian Americans are still uh, one of the, um, if not the fastest growing groups in the United States. And partially that has been fed by um, reforms in immigration policy. And if in fact, uh, the absence of having a co coherent immigration policy and the um, incessant rhetoric on the part of uh, the Trump administration to not close the borders, but also to um, not admit a lot of skilled workers as well from particularly Asian countries, that I think that's gonna be a really uh, deep issue for a lot of Asians. I also think what it is is the ways in which the, the, um, the discussion, even to, to this day, Trump's call of the notion about the COVID-19 as the Chinese virus has fueled across the board a huge number of anti-Asian uh, harassment if, and, and indeed violence in many cases directed against uh, different age cohorts, directed against Asian Americans, uh, 
Russell Jung over at San Francisco State has a terrific project called Stop uh, a a Asian American API Racism that really has been trying to monitor and record some of these kinds of things. I think people are, are very much concerned about the level of kind of hostility that becomes directed um, against uh, Asian Americans as a result of the pandemic itself. In fact, uh, I'm this colleague on campus who works for the sciences, who was a lucky supermarket in Oakland and got berated by this couple for being the cause of why uh, we have the pandemic in the United States. And she certainly was, was pretty much put off by uh, that, that, that kind of scenario as well. The other things is that there's a high percentage, particularly in the Bay Area, of Asian Americans as small entrepreneurs in small businesses and restaurants. And many of the, as well as service workers. Uh, we have a huge number, for example, of Filipino nurses uh, throughout the Bay Area. So the, the ways in which um, the uh, pandemic has unfolded with the absence of sort of strong sort of federal level policies and practices um, has made many of these people vulnerable and open to, uh, you know, I mean, the, the health risks that, that sort of uh, occur from that are, 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 are pretty intense. I don't know if I'm getting at your question, Michael. I'm just trying to say like there are issues among Asian Americans that, um, that I think will, will have them, which they have in mind as they head towards the polls. Uh, I know. I think that that's an outstanding survey. I think, and it is important to recognize the the ways in which anti Asian racism has really been on the rise in the last. I mean, just in the last six months, it's it's really quite startling. It's uh, it's hard to avoid in in many respects that that this is a, a very much a new front, and it, it, it it's reminder that the the president's words have consequences, like the the term that. He, you know, and he uses, he has in the past used even more inflammatory, explicitly racist language that I, I won't repeat to describe this disease. And the insistence on blaming China for this when, um, you know, that there's, there's a, a kind of um, a tremendous kind of um, consequence to the ways in which this gets framed. Mm -hmm. um, just on that note, then, I, I, one of the things to think about is, is why is it that, that California has so many ballot measures that are focused on issues of race? It seems like <laughs> you're very determined to kind of govern ourselves through ballot measures around race. And, and, and maybe this would be an opportunity to ask you to talk about Prop 16 and uh, the affirmative action debate, if you don't mind. No, maybe no, no. I, uh, I, think, I, th I think we've always had a lot of these issues regarding um, sort of race. And it, it, it to sort of a, a bellwether of, of the ways in which this may get enacted in other states as well. I mean, we're an incredibly diverse state. We're one in which the, um, there's no longer a white majority uh, in the state itself, although uh, there's probably a, a white majority with respect to the electorate. Um, I just think, uh, I, I know, I don't think, know if I have an easy answer to that. I just think that, you know, it's just that, it's just that um, many of these issues have surfaced and uh, it, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I haven't seen very much of and I was looking for, maybe you know, is polling data on Proposition 16, on the repeal of 209. I have not seen very much data on that, um, which surprises me. You know, but um, it is, um, there's a researcher at, uh, on our campus that has done some interesting things which show that, in fact, the damage in which uh, at UC, uh, in terms of the enrollment of, of underrepresented minorities, and how that has not, in fact, helped whites and Asians uh, take advantage of that, of that drop off. Uh, and so it seems like a very interesting kind of ways in which the debate could be reframed, particularly, um, you know, from a zero sum game in which, you know, some people gain uh, as other groups lose. But in fact, into one that's much more uh, nuanced with respect to kind of what the long term inc uh, outcomes are for uh, different groups that have been laboring under Proposition 209. But 
Yeah, the, uh, there, that, there's a good study that has been produced uh, that by the, through the University of California. There was a big story about it in the New York Times, particularly around Prop 16, that I think indicated exactly what you suggested, that in fact, that, um, that, that, that there are, you know, a lot of educational opportunities for people who test really good on the SAT, really well on the SATs and have high GPAs, uh, and that were the, United, the University of California to uh, reinstitute affirmative action and raise the number of particularly Black and Latinx students. Because when Prop 209 passed in California, I, I actually have data on that uh, slide that I did not get to show in my previous lecture. Um, but that uh, when, when Prop 209 passed, African-American enrollment at the University of California went from about 11% to less than two. Mm -hmm. um, here's the slide, uh, such as it is. Um, uh, and, the say, and a similar drop occurred with uh, Hispanic students that went from being a little over 20% to being less than 10%. Um, uh, at the same time, what this means is that Black and Latinx people are really having uh, severe impacts in terms of their uh, access to higher education, their access to middle class jobs, their access to a brighter economic future. Whereas when Asian Americans are not, you know, do, are not able to enroll at the University of California at such high rates, uh, they find other colleges to go to. There are other colleges and universities that welcome them with open arms, and they then are able to proceed along the same upper middle class trajectory that they began on. Um, so there is, a, but what we have in Prop 16, unfortunately, what we had in the case of the Harvard. Uh, lawsuit that made it to the Supreme Court is effectively a, a certain Asian American groups attempting to prevent affirmative action because they they claim that this is will you know is anti Asian racism and that we have the Asian Americans essentially being pitted against you know engage you know pitted against Black and Brown folks mm -hmm. for what is seen but should not be in my opinion as a zero sum game the college admissions is not a zero sum game um, but it is being pitched in this way. Correct. Yes, that's right. That's good. Well, uh, with th with that, I mean, I, I don't. I, I I feel bad that I got the last word in here, but like I <laughs> good ask word. all of you to unmute yourselves and to give Professor Omi a round of applause and thank yeah. him. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I will happily stick around if any of you do have additional Thank questions um, for a little bit, but I think you know we have tested Professor Omi's uh, endurance and strength <laughs> over these last two hours. Uh, but thank you, Michael. I really deeply appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. We've got folks ask great questions. So. Um...